And it was because of those stories that throughout time, we found the strength to do those in those kinds of moments. We've been able to look to those stories to draw strength, right? To, to do those things, to become who we are, even if that's doing something that seems totally that, that it, to the reasonable, logical mind is a totally crazy thing to do, but it was so important that you did the crazy thing, that that, that hero did the crazy thing. This is Way of the Artist with Brandon Colby Cook and Evan Schulte, exploring the challenges of the creative call so that you can claim your own path and make your life a work of art. Well, everybody, we're back with Way of the Artist podcast, and I'm excited for this conversation, Brandon. I mean, I'm always excited for our conversations, but I'm especially excited for this one. I mean, who knows where it'll go, but at the outset, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. So we're calling this one the reality of myth, and this came out of a conversation that we had, I don't know, if you how many days back? I don't know, like four or five days ago, something like that. And it started off in a sense, I'll, I'll try and give like the, the rundown. I feel like the context I think might be, be good for everybody on this one. So there's this saying that goes something like this from the acting teacher, Sanford Meisner. And he said, the theater is not an imitation of, of life. It demands an even greater truth. And that has a lot to do with this conversation that we're having because he's talking to, at least in my mind, he's talking to how art and story and as we're getting into myth, how it plays a certain kind of role in human life. In that we use these mediums as a means of talking about and expressing and getting into these realities of life, these invisible realities of life that we can only talk about in these sort of, in through these kinds of mediums and that in so many ways those things are more real than than the reality that we typically sort of live by or or what we what we see so i'm excited to just get into a conversation about myth i feel like that's something that's becoming more important for me um something that i'm definitely finding a lot of inspiration and and focus on and it's showing me a lot of things. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's the basic background to, you know, where this conversation is coming from. Brandon, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Well, I'm excited about this one as well, man. It, it does feel like one of those conversations where there'll be stuff left on the table at the end of this, because I feel like it's such a big thing to explore because we're going to, we're going to get into story to some degree, I, I, I'm sure. And, um, you know, and then you go down that road and then there's so many things. And for me, story is such an important part of my life. It's just, you know, it's, it's something I've been on kind of a pursuit. I've been after it since I was a teenager. I mean, just, you know, not just understanding story, but the desire to like, like know what makes a good story and why a story is great and how to do it myself. And, you know, and, and, uh, the, the thing is in the pursuit of story, I've also found that you ultimately end up having to look at your own life as the, you know, the, the textbook of answers is kind of within you. And yet you're using um, myth and, and these elements of story and they're all just kind of techniques and ideas until you dig into yourself and then you pull them out. So anyway, I mean, one thing that I'm, I'm, I'm interested in maybe kicking off with, and I'll throw this out right away, is we were talking about, so I was doing some research this week, and I'm, I've been building a class on story and, and stuff, 
And as I was, Evan and I were talking about this, I decided I would do a bit of research on myth and whatnot. And, you know, there's this one thing that I don't always talk about. And I realized I should, we should put more focus on this. This is a big part of story. And I often, when I talk about with my students about story, I was not talk about the flawed character and how important that is. And you need a flaw. And if they're too perfect, you create what I call the Superman syndrome, which is where you have a character that is what for one unrelatable and then has nowhere to go. There's no arc. There's no change. But another interesting element kind of relates to flaw, but not explicitly is the reluctant hero. And, uh, you know, I'm sure you've heard of this before. And if you haven't, well, We're going to explore it. But the reluctance of the hero is a very interesting element. It was something that I was like, yeah, this is such an important part of the myth of the journey. If you have a character that isn't reluctant, and I'll let you share more of this because Evan put out some big thoughts, you know, some thoughts that really resonated with me is like, you don't really trust the the person that isn't reluctant. The person that's just like too gung ho. It's like, well, what do you, you know, the reluctance actually kind of is more relatable and, and um, reluctance is related to fear and it's also related to the shadow. And there is a certain element which is truthful about that because I think we can all relate to the, the desire to stay comfortable and we don't necessarily like change. We don't, you know, change is going to inevitable. It's going to happen in life, especially if you push yourself towards goals and aspirations or you have to show up for something that's difficult. Change is necessary, but we don't, pursue change. Most of us don't until we realize something's wrong. Like sometimes I will pursue change, but I only pursue change when I realize, Hey, I need to change. Something is not working and I'm starting to feel the pain of it not working. So I actively go after change, but I'm reluctant to change at first because I think maybe I can stay the way I am and still get what I want. And then eventually I realize, no, I'm going to have to change. And I think story captures this myth in all heroes and it's it's such an interesting thing for us to explore so anyway um yeah uh the reluctant hero and the reluctance of myth and and the reluctance of going on the journey i think this also relates i'll pair one last thing before i pass it over you know in way of the artist we talk about you know finding your way and, and claiming your path and embracing your path and all of that but we have to suspect that there is a reluctance for you to do that. And that's honest and it's real because there's something to do with it's scary to step out on your own and carve your own path and trailblaze. And, you know, even sometimes to follow a path that someone else did that you maybe don't feel like you can match up to or live up to. And reluctance, I think what I want to start this podcast with is that even when you have these big goals, it's human to be reluctant to go after them. It's human to have fear and to not feel good enough and all of that stuff. And I think that's why myth requires that because that's the first, one of the first major touch points of journey is that we, we have to first face our fear and our reluctance to even go on the journey at all. Yeah. Because there's something in, like, typically the story is because there's something bigger that's being asked, something that's bigger than ourselves, and and it pushes up against many things. It can push up against our, our sense of identity or pushes into our fears. It pushes us into an unknown space. And so, yeah, there's there's that reluctance to do it. And... And as you're saying that whole aspect of, you know, the, the reluctant hero, but also there's a, I think, you know, there's also the myth of the, of the unreluctant hero, unreluctant, is that a word? <laughs> <laughs> but it's the, the one who isn't. And, and as you're saying, like, there's something about that, that we are a bit, I think, suspicious of you know, when we, when we see that in the story and, and, and typically it means that they have just yet to run into that, that thing. And it didn't occur to me in our pre-chat, but just as you were talking now, I was thinking of 
what came to mind was uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, which I mean, look, it's it's based on a true story and true events, but there's absolutely mythic elements in the in in the storytelling of this thing because I mean, war is one of the biggest subjects of myth, you know, because of how how powerful of an event it is, how how shaking of an event it is for the people who are who are not just in it but the people who live during those times right particularly uh, in the first world war right where it takes place but like in the in the book but also in the fantastic new movie adaptation of it and you see the beginning of it where you have all of these young guys just like they're just they're so psyched to go to war and fight for the fatherland and all of this stuff. And it's like, they haven't, they, there's no reluctance to, to what they're doing. Right. And they fucking get out there and it's just like, suddenly it's like you're, they're faced with the reality of what's going on. Right. And, and there's a complete shift in, in who they are. And I mean, it's a tragic, it's a tragic story. And I think that's often how that, that story goes. It often ends in a tragedy. I think not necessarily because there's also the story of the person who goes out with, you know, like, yes, I'm ready to be this thing. And then they hit the, the <clears throat> excuse me. And then they confront the shadow. They confront the challenge. They suddenly are confronted with some part of themselves, something that they didn't expect, something, something. And now they have to, now they run into the reluctance within themselves. Like, I didn't really actually understand what this entailed and I don't know if I can do this. Right. And then wherever the story goes from there. So, I mean, I love that you brought in this, you know, when you said that, you know, and, and just as someone who has studied, you know, and, and written many stories, but also studied the mechanics of, of story as much as you have, you know, and, and you just having this discovery for yourself, not that was something you were unfamiliar with, but just the power and, and the importance of that, of that aspect of it, right? Like it's, it's, it's a huge one because in the mythic element, that's, it's almost, I don't know, maybe it's essential. It like whether the person has it at the beginning or doesn't, there's, there's a, something I think that you have to be very conscious, conscious, conscientious about when it comes to that element, because it plays such an important role in who that person is at that point in time. What are, what are their, their fears? What are their desires? What, what are their weaknesses? What are their flaws it says so many you know you you talk a lot about flaw in character i mean reluctance says a lot about what their potential flaws could potential could could be right and i mean coming back into just a general thing conversation about myth you know it's not just because oh yes the, these are just components that make that make up a good story these things are supposedly be deeply reflective to us as as its audience you know these are things that are supposed to that are supposed to shake us deeply to show us something about ourselves and say like hey what are what are the things that life is asking of you right that your situation is asking of you you know, the, the calling that we often talk about that maybe you're ignoring, that maybe you're afraid to go towards, right? And, and, or you're reluctant to go towards that thing, right? But it is towards that thing that you, you have to go, right? And I think also that reluctance, uh, I'm, no, I'm speaking a lot, but let me throw one more element into this in, in terms of the mythic structure is that there's this quality of leaving home 
that is very often in all of the great myths. You have to leave the comforts of where you are from on some level. And you see that, you know, and it doesn't necessarily mean literally like, you know, the person's house, but the, it's home is that place where things are safe and easy and comfortable. But in order to become fully human, to be, to be, to become who you are supposed to be requires you to leave that place. And so it's only natural that there's that reluctance that comes, that comes with it. So just throwing that in the ring. Yeah. So there's a bunch of interesting things. Okay. One thing that I just want to mention this before I forget implication. So it's the implication of not being reluctant unreluctant. I don't know if that's a word either, but, but the implication of that, you know, and I think you use a, you know, all quiet on the Western front is a great example of that, you know, and there are other stories, um, a lot related to war that are like that, where you got the young soldier who's ready to get out there and have the good fight and has no idea what they're getting into. And then, you know, they either come back like post-traumatic stress, traumatized, whatever. And, uh, you know, and, there's something relatable about that story. This is kind of like um, the loss of innocence, you know, and I think that's, there is a myth in the loss of innocence and, and um, you know, the implications of being without reluctance might mean that you are innocent, you know, and that you don't really know what you're signing up for. You don't really know the journey that you're about to go on. And I think that, Regardless of if the character is reluctant or not reluctant, there are implications either way that need to be honored by myth. And there's something true about that that we all resonate with, where when someone is not reluctant, those of us who know go, oh boy, okay, good luck. You know, like someone says, I want to be an actor. And you're like, okay. And those experienced actors go, okay, good luck. I hope you can hang in there, you know, because yeah. you're in for a fucking ride. <laughs> But at the same time, that lack of reluctance, that willingness to go out for it and, and, and do it is a beautiful thing. And innocence can provide that, that ability for you to leap without really looking quality, which sometimes we need a hero to have. We need someone to just be like, I'll jump in. I don't know what I'm getting into, but I'll jump in. And then they live up to it, you know, and, but we need to honor their, if they knew what they were getting into, they might not have leaped so blindly, you know? And so in some ways we can launch a character into a story. We can launch ourselves into a story, you know, and if we find ourselves without reluctance, we might be like, okay, well, you know, maybe the humility is, I don't know what I'm getting into, but you know, I suppose I'll find out, but I want to do this and I'm going to go for it. I think the reluctant hero is, um, an interesting thing because as you pointed out in our pre-talk, Evan, you know, the reluctant hero has some kind of self-awareness that the unreluctant hero doesn't. They know something about themselves and about the world that is causing them to resist the call, which is another part of myth, the call. Something calls, and you, can, you know, look at the artist, what's your calling, right? It's like, what is, re why are you resisting your calling? Right. But in a story, it's the call, the call to action, the call to do something. And uh, I often talk about this in the story, the inciting incident, the event that happens outside of you that incites action and forces you, forces your hand. No, it doesn't matter how reluctant you are. You decide my values are higher than my reluctance. And so I, even though I'm reluctant, I must do what I must do. And, um, it doesn't matter how I feel. It doesn't matter that I'm scared. It doesn't matter that I don't think I'm good enough. I'm going to give it a shot because some things are worth dying for. Some things are worth going for. Um, but something we talked about, and I think this is an interesting element for us to parlay into is the shadow. And this is another big discovery that I had, which was that the antagonist or the antagonistic force in your story is interlinked with the main character, the protagonist or the hero, because it has something to do with their shadow. And the shadow, you know, is, um, a little bit, uh, it's not, it's not, um, I don't think you can define it necessarily in one thing, but it has a lot to do with your fear or maybe your dark side. Maybe it has something to do with your flaw. Um, but 
going and answering the call requires us to face our shadow, which is something we may spend our entire life avoiding. And the shadow is in some ways a reflection of the antagonist. So if you have a physical antagonist, like an actual person, they somehow embody some part of you that you avoid and deny in yourself and don't like about yourself. And that's actually part of what makes a great story because by facing the antagonist, you actually, you actually have to face your shadow, which is like, what's more fucking mythical than that? You know what I mean? That this, this darkness in you is the very thing you're trying to overcome that's been manifest in the world. And so you look at these people who go, well, you know, these people are bad and I hate this and whatever. It's like, yeah, because that's your shadow. You, you may be unaware that this is inside of you, but the very things you hate are usually a mirror, not usually, they're always somehow a mirror reflection of what's inside of you that either you are unaware of and deny or you're aware of and you see. And it's okay to root out bad things in the external world, but understand that as you root out that in the world, you're also on a journey to root it out of yourself. And myth has this parallel. It's always going on. We talk about this in story all the time. What's the external struggle and the internal struggle? And and most new storytellers will miss the internal struggle. The external struggle is very easy. Oh, it's a bad guy. I'm going to beat him up and you know, whatever. We got to stop him from launching the bomb or something, right? But it's like, yeah, but how does that character reflect what's in your main character? How do they show the, th- the thing? So a, a great example would be Batman and the Joker. The Joker is the ideal reflection of Batman. And, you know, often people like are more interested in the Joker than they are in Batman. Part of it is because like the Dark Knight, you know, as is, is, is he's called, is his shadow. But his shadow and, and the whole thing about Batman is like Batman doesn't kill. Like that's kind of the, well, whatever. I don't know if that'll change one day, but whatever. That's kind of part of the myth of him, right? This iconic character. And then you got the Joker, who's this kind of chaos and this darkness and this destruction. But Batman is that. And anyway, Evan, I I don't want to go too far off the rails. I just want to kind of parlay into this whole the shadow. Because I think the reluctance has a lot to do with we don't want to face our shadow. We don't want to admit our shadow. We don't want to acknowledge it. But the hero's journey is very much about acknowledging the shadow. Yeah, I I think this is a lot, you know, I'm some of our our last podcast that we did about creating beyond the divisive. I mean, I think that that's part of that whole deep mythic quality, the wisdom of of mythic storytelling is because it's aware and it makes that connection. It's like, "Oh no, hey, the, the this villain is not just some other, some outside thing." This this villain is is a reflection of as you said of that shadow of or and and maybe that reluctance of the hero right they're just like this manifestation right they're just like a a physical or whatever manifestation of that internal thing and it continues so it keeps that connection right of we're saying it's like no this this we're not cut off from from these from these types of people you know like we are actually deeply connected to these people they didn't just spring out on their own out of nothing they came from they came from the the same world that we come from you know and you, know, you bring up batman and joker is is such a great sort of more modern iconic mythic version of that because yeah like you know the joker is is you know, especially with a lot of the interpretations of him, he's he's this chaos creator, right? This violent chaos creator. And in so many ways, that's a reflection of Batman, you know, of Bruce Wayne, because he, Bruce Wayne's an outlaw. When you actually think about it, Bruce, Bruce, you know, he's maybe not a criminal in the strictest sense, but he's certainly an outlaw in the sense that he's breaking laws, right? Like he's doing things, but he's doing it 
out of his own sense of doing what's what's right and doing what's what he feels is is needed but that that violent chaos is in him that capacity to do really bad things is in him and you know a lot of a lot of the the stories around around that character reflect that they 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 show and they navigate that that tightrope that he has to walk in terms of whether he becomes like the criminals himself and it's just because it's really just a few things that separate him from <laughs> from the guys that he's trying to to shut down and that's sort of his his life his his journey his because he's filled with rage you know like batman is a rage filled hero mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's something that he has to learn how to deal with and channel into the right right places and and uh so yeah that's i, I love that you brought mm -hmm. you brought that character into because he is a, a fantastic example Okay, so something about Batman, which I think is just coming up for me as we're talking, is he is rage filled because his parents were killed by you know a criminal, and he had to live without them and grow up essentially, you know, with um, Alfred as like this butler who's kind of like raising him and become his mentor. And you know, you think about that, like just think about his struggle, right? Like some someone comes along and just kills your parents. Well, you're a child for like some spare change and you become this, you're, you know, you're this wealthy, powerful person. You, and you go, you know, I want to fucking get the person that did that to me. And that's a lot of the reason what drives Batman. The thing that makes Batman good is his resistance to killing. Because if you think about it, the thing that makes a good char a character good versus bad is that they won't do the things that the bad character will do which handcuffs them to some degree and gives the antagonist or the bad guy more power because the bad guys are willing to do things that the good guys aren't willing to do and that's part of the reason why they have the advantage but if you believe in good and you want good in the world and that's really truly what you're fighting for then you will be okay with the handcuffs that you have and you know, you can look at it as like, you know, uh, Batman, I don't just give me an example, comes across somebody mugging some old woman and he could kill that person and just be like, don't want that person around anymore. And th the, the whole thing is that he doesn't. I mean, that line between being bad and being good is so thin. And that's part of the reason why we don't, we don't, um, like it's illegal to be a vigilante in our world. You know, but we, we will hear stories of vigilantes, how vigilantes went after bad people and fucking did them in. And there's a certain part of us as humanity that's like, yeah, fucking got that person. Like, fuck them, you know? But there's also a certain element of like, yeah, but if we just let the world do that, if you can just go out and like kill somebody because they quote unquote did something wrong or bad, like first it starts off with really bad stuff. But where does that slippery slope end up? You know, all of a sudden someone's just done something minor and then someone can go out and just totally obliterate them, obliterate their life, you know, like, and it's tolerated. Like we could very easily slip into chaos and the wild west, a really bad situation, right? And this is the thing is like, I think ultimately with myth, <laughs> the one of the core fucking ingredients is good and bad. We're always fucking trying to investigate that. And you know, I mean, haven't you been watching a show and the good guy has the bad guy pinned and we're like, you know, I've had this moment. I mean, I don't know if everyone else has had it, but definitely with like 80s and 90s movies and stuff, it was like, just fucking kill him. Just fucking eliminate him. Then you don't have to worry about him anymore. And the character won't and you're almost frustrated that they won't because you know that maybe that person might come back and like it becomes a, haunts them somehow. Yeah. But like that line, we, we, we have to draw a line. If you really truly want good in the world, we have to have boundary. We have to draw a line. And, you know, and, and even though it's easier to do the bad thing, that's where good exists. Good exists because it, it somehow manages 
to try to not do the easy thing, which is where bad becomes really fucking bad, you know? Um, but anyway, I mean, the shadow is interesting because I think the shadow is a very much a reflection of the ego, whereas the ego wants destruction and it wants, it's justified. And I think we need to, you know, myth teaches us a lot about our justifications and it teaches us a lot about our, our, our shadow because it makes us look at it and go like, just because this would be easier and just because you want this doesn't mean you should do it. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. And, um, you know, I, I truly, something I, I truly believe and something I've definitely, uh, experienced and explored a lot over the last, like, you know, several years is where does bad actually find ground? And I've concluded that usually bad exists in the realm of what's easier. Usually in, in most cases you can track it back to, it was just easier to do the bad thing. And the justification is that I'll only do it the one time. Um, I think it's Jordan Belfer. I think that's his name. Who is the guy who, who the story of the wolf on wall street is about. Yeah. He shares a story, which I think is interesting where he talks about how he could sell a stock for, I don't know, uh, the, a six cent stock for two cents or whatever, something like that, or two cents stock for six cents. I forget how it works, but, and he would get like essentially a million dollars, like a bag of cash, a million dollars. And the first time he was confronted with his idea, he was like, yeah, he's like, okay, well, I'll just do it the once, then I'll be set up. And he said, you know, and the problem is, is that you do it the once and it's easier to do it the second time. And all of a sudden you're doing the second and the third. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're who I am and you fucked everybody over. And he says that he's, you know, trying to repair the damages he's done in the world. But that guy created a tremendous, tremendous amount of damage in people's lives in the world. Like, almost to the point where it irredeemable, you know what I mean? And as humanity, you know, we, we navigate that there are people like this that exist. But if we look at him like just a villain and say, Oh, he's just out to get everyone. And he just wanted to fuck everyone over. He didn't, he was self-serving and it was easier to self serve. And he justified it by, it was one time he was going to do it. And then it became easier to do the second and easier to do the second. And that's where, that's where bad shit happens. It, it just happens because it just becomes easier and your conscience slowly gets killed off. Final note, if that man kills somebody, it's easier to kill the next person. It's easier to kill the next person. It's easier to kill the next person. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're the murderer, right? And then, then you need a vigilante to come after you. Because what if, you know, the other thing too is, what if he makes the wrong call? What if he kills an innocent thinking they're bad? Doesn't that tarnish him forever? And you go, uh, maybe not. You go, well, what if that was your brother, your sister, your mother, your wife, your husband, your child, that, that this Batman, this hero came and killed because they thought they were bad and he was misinformed and he didn't know. Well, I think you'd fucking hate him and I think you'd want to kill Batman and that might turn you into the Joker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean... Like going, there's something that you say we talking about uh, Jordan, Jordan Belf, Belfor, Belfort, Belfort, Belfort. Oh yeah, it's it's in, in like his story because it's in many ways very easy to sit there and you know for us to sit and 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 condemn the decisions that he made. And, and, but I think part of, again, if you, if you're seeking out that mythic quality to his story, I mean, I start to go down the direction of, well, if I was in that position where like, man, this, this, amount of money was just there kind of for the kind of for the taking you know like you hope that that you would you would have enough of a spine to to not do the things that's going to really destroy other people you know but 
there's this again this reflection of of his type you know like like especially you want to talk about archetypes which is something that you know i don't have a lot of expertise in it's something that i'm interested in learning more about but if you look at sort of his sort of a, as an as an archetype like that's there's something about him and in his time and in his place and we can see it as a reflection of our society that is so focused on status and and wealth and and image and all of these things that doing these things afforded him right like it's it's really not so hard to see how somebody goes down that path and for us to ask ourselves you know truly how like would we have done any different in his position you know i think in many ways that's that's like the important thing for us to be asking when we watch that that story not necess not just as saying like oh man look at what this guy did no 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 hang on a second how how is actually he like you how is you know and, and especially because if you look you know the the book or the movie or whatever he's he's both like, like i'm trying to think of who would the antagonist actually really be in that story it's like he's almost his own antagonist in the whole situation his own greed his own you know his own pride and stubbornness and hubris all of those things are in so many ways the thing that that does him in by by the end of it all but it's you he's just such a reflection of his of his culture and of and of his time and and how do we all in our own ways maybe on a much much smaller level how do we kind of act the same way mm -hmm. right S just how how do we in our own way are we just kind of seeking our own you know pleasure you know like just fueling our own our own greed how how often do we make bad decisions maybe in the sense of compromising our relationships with our friends our family whatever it is so that we can chase a few more dollars down kind of a thing you know all of these things that that in our own way we're doing the same thing mm -hmm. so it's uh, like again i think that this is you know coming back to the power of coming back to myth which you know again is one of the reasons why i think that i'm so interested in it and why on many levels i feel like we've been talking about it more recently is because there's so much power to it that seems to be lacking in in so much of our our storytelling which is you know not to go over too much ground that we've actually covered a lot of in in interesting little ways over the last number of podcasts but you know there's uh there can be just a, a shallowness and an emptiness in terms of just let's create content there's something that's entertaining kind of just checking boxes of of you know well, yeah a story should have this and it should have that and in and getting back to that that quality of myth which is which is it's there to to strip you in so many ways like a great story strips you down it rocks you a little bit it, it changes you it 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 shakes you up slaps you across the face <laughs> you know punches you in the chest you know like how all of these these things like it, it's it's a myth has a disruptive disturbing quality to it and not i mean disturbing as in like necessarily grotesque you know even though a lot of myths do have grotesque elements to them they're it's always in in service of trying to communicate something really really 
freaking deep and in a way that can almost be confusing as well. I think that's another quality of myth is that you've really got to sit with them and in many ways you can you continue to come back to them and you find new things in it. They change and as you as you change and as you grow and get older and all of these things there's they have they, they have such a profound level of depth to them in in how they understand and and connect to humanity which you know humanity is a word that we haven't brought into it but you were saying some things interesting some interesting things about our you know humanity before we started recording do you remember some of what you were saying there i'm trying to remember some of what you were saying with that and i was like oh you, you had some you had some really great great points <laughs> to say about about all of that but like it's it's i mean myth is so deeply connected to our to our humanity and not it's not so much caught up in in political kinds of conversations it's it's again it's it's cutting through a lot of those things yeah you know i i don't know we talked about a lot of stuff and and it's it's hard for me to remember at the moment you know okay well maybe it, maybe i'll think about it maybe it'll come back during this conversation i hope it does um something that we're kind of after in this conversation which i just kind of dawned on me is like okay i think we've just discussed some of these interesting elements that brought us here the shadow the reluctance and whatnot but um the truth you know there's a something about the myth of story which tells a truth that is almost inaccessible without it and you know i'm thinking about this and i'm like i think because there's a certain element to quote unquote reality that's very much complacent and we're not pushed. We're not pressured. We have all these ways of distracting ourselves and not facing our fears and our insecurities. And we have ways of bolstering our ego to make us, you know, have an image of having it together. And, you know, and we're just trying to get by. And I think there's something fucking so human about that. And I don't think anybody should feel bad about that. I think that's, I think it's something we all do. And I think it's, it's totally natural. And, there is a certain amount of life, which is, I just need to survive the day, the week, the month, the year, the decade, the whatever, my life. There is an element which is very real, like very that much the reality of, I just need to fucking function, pay my bills, feed myself, keep some shelter, um, not have everyone fucking hate me, figure out how to have some friends and some connections that are real and not a bunch of bullshit where everyone's just using me because we know there are users and all sorts of, you know, fucked up people out there and we're just trying to find our tribe and navigate it and not be hurt and whatever. And I think that this is an element that's always at play. And sometimes we have it managed and sometimes we don't. And when we don't have it managed, you know, our life's very much just about let me get through the day, let me survive, let me let me fucking figure out how I'm going to pay the bills this month and whatever. And I, and I think we can come and visit that place and we can leave that place and come back to it. And, and then there's like, there's the element of where myth takes us outside of our own world. And something that's kind of coming up for me is one of the things that myth does in story, but myth in story does is it shows us an interconnectedness that we know is true, but we don't always want to see. For example, the relationship to our shadow and, you know, Jordan Belfer and all that uh, bit we went into about how there's a part of him in all of us that we don't like to admit. And it's easier for us to sometimes go, that guy's a bad guy and he's horrible. And like, we, we, we should get rid of people like him in the world. And it's like, yeah, but if, if you are him, do you still agree? And it's like, well, no. So I, the, so my way to maintain that story, that false narrative is to pretend that I am not like him and that we are different and that he is an anomaly and that, you know, 
this is just not anything to do with me. And myth goes, actually, you are more intertwined with the antagonistic hate that you have than you think. And that's the truth that we don't always like to see. But the truth is, is what makes a kind of cohesive self-awareness. It's what brings humanity together. And it's also what makes us actually aware. And it actually gives us access to our greatest superpower, which is, you know, our, our, you know, our gifts, right? Because the thing is, if you, if you sit on a high horse and a pedestal and you just exist as I'm perfect, I do no wrong. And there's nothing, no shadow in me then you're going to just look at everybody who who exemplifies the shadow and you're just going to go, well, you know, they're all bad and I'm the one that has it figured out. And I think this is part of the problem with media today. People take that position and then they go, I'm going to tell you how to be. I'm going to show you where the power should be. I'm going to show you what's wrong with the world and I'm going to sit on my high horse and you don't see it, but I do. And I'm going to show it to you through my media, through my story, through my movie or through whatever. And we're all like, that's bullshit, you know? And there's a certain amount of people that go along with it because they're sitting in that same kind of seat you're sitting in and they go, yeah, I agree with it. But like, it's bullshit. It's not real. And and I think something about, um, you know, tribalism is that you can have a tribe that's a fucking bad, fucking evil tribe, but they think they're good and they think they're fighting the good fight. And that's a slippery slope too. Whereas, you know, like the whole tribalism of we're right and you're all wrong and we can kind of kill you because we're the righteous ones. That's a fucking dangerous fucking death cult. You know what I mean? That's a fucking bad group. And uh, you can slip into not just your own badness in yourself. You can slip into your badness with your group because you start agreeing with everything they say and you start thinking, yeah, they're right. Look at the Nazis. Everybody likes to go, oh, the Nazis are bad. You're a Nazi, Nazi, Nazi. It's like, okay, but try to understand how those kids went down that fucking road. They were just good, innocent kids who were told a narrative about how somebody was fucking them over and somebody was hurting their family and hurting their culture and how the whole world was putting their foot on them and they needed to step up and become. And so they were indoctrinated in this cult of Nazism. Like some, you know, they were kids, they were seven years old. And then all of a sudden they're 15 and they're fighting in a war as Nazi youth. And like, you know, and they were, they, they were just kids that wanted to go to the park and to go to the park, you had to agree with the Nazi party and you were only seven years old. You didn't know what you were agreeing to. The point is, is that if we can look at the Nazis and we say, Oh, Nazis are bad. And I'm, I agree. What they did was fucked <laughs> defending them in any form. But I'm saying that we need to see how that slope by a good person goes down that road, that they were not bad fucking apples in the beginning. Some of them probably were, but that's going to happen in every group. But good kids who loved, who, who, who just wanted you know, to, 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 to stand up for their family and their tribe and their community got sucked down a road of being fucking the worst atrocity of humanity that, you know, we often reference today, which I'm sure they're even worse than that. But that was, that happened. Right. And I think the thing is, is like myth sometimes brings a, a, a truth that lets us see that we're not as different as we think. And, um, I don't think we always like that truth, but when it's done well and it's not preachy, we, we, that's the slap in the face. That's the punch in the chest you're talking about where it's like, oh fuck, I can see it now. And then, and I think what myth does in a way is it, it can be transformative in that it can get us to remove hate and divisiveness because, um, you know, I do think there is something about myth, which is like, we want I think in our hearts, we do want good to reside. We want good to win. But I think in some ways for us to actually achieve that goal that we're after, we have to also see the shadow and the darkness so that it becomes a process of not just rooting it out in the world, but rooting it out in ourselves. Because remember that it came 
out of us. We are, you know, all the narcissism that's going on in the world right now is a product of our fucked up values in our culture. It's, you know, yeah. And it's, you know, I'm not saying narcissists are good and like I fucking prefer if they weren't around to some degree, but we have to understand that narcissism was in it's, it's embraced by our culture. And that's why they say, well, not everybody's a narcissist, but people have narcissistic tendencies. We have tendencies because we've let a certain amount of, hey, I'm going to take care of me flourish. And I don't care that my phone was made by slaves in some other country. I'm not going to think about that. Yet at the same time, I'm be a hypocrite, hi- hypocrite and say, hey, we shouldn't have this in the world. And yet it's like, yeah, but you're participating in the whole fucking thing. And, and, and we have to make our peace with that. And that's not easy. The truth is fucking brutal. Is once we start to see the interconnectedness of it, it can be, but it can be beautiful. It can be bru- beautiful. It's beautiful and brutal all at the same time. Anyway, myth, I think, it on many levels tethers certain things, the brutal and the beautiful together. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Oh, man. You said a lot of things there. <laughs> I kind of don't know where to jump, well, jump in. Well, I mean, yeah, that's, I mean, the, the truth thing is, uh, I mean, yeah, like that, I think that's a big word that you brought into this whole thing, like coming back to that whole thing, like the reality of myth, like that's what myth does is like that. The reality is, is, is it's bringing a truth, it's bringing a truth that isn't, that isn't, you know, something that you can like touch with your hands, you know, it's, it's it's telling you something that's almost it's in the fabric of nature itself, you know, and, and making you aware of that, that thing. And, you know, those invisible things are often, they're hard things to, to wrestle with. They're hard things to, to tango with, which is why we have story because they actually help us find a way of, of entering into a space with them and, and grasping them at some, at some level, you know, which is interesting because some people like to just, you know, especially in, in today's day and age, lots of people just are far more comfortable just to completely do without, you know, and, and because it's, it is, there's something, there's something so challenging about myths, you know, in the way that they challenge us and our perceptions of things that, so many of us have just decided to ignore them, you know, and it's like, you know what, let's just deal with objective reality because it's simpler, even though there's a lot of complex things to understand in that space in a weird way. It's like, it's less scary, you know, but it, you can't ignore it, you know, like you can't ignore those invisible things just because they make you uncomfortable. But I think that's, you know, great myth makes it all approachable, you know, like a good story. And then we can just nod our heads and go like, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Like it just can hit, hit us in a, in a certain place where, where we can deepen our relationship to and with life and with ourselves. One thing I wanted to bring into this conversation, because I know for me, uh, this person has been a fairly influential in, in my life more recently you know like this year especially is uh, a guy by the name of of martin shaw and he's a storyteller author speaker teacher all of these things and and who's very much within you know his 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 ground is is in the land of myth and i'm nowhere <laughs> I won't even compare myself in, in the same understanding of myth as him, but there's something that, uh, he said that I thought would be, would be good to bring in here. And it was this comment he made about how in our sort of in our time right now, most of us are living like one foot in front of our faces you know, and both literally and figuratively, you know, like you think about our phones or whatever, it's just like one foot away from us. But even on a, 
on a more metaphorical sense, how much of us are just like, we're just dealing with the things that are just so close right in front of us. And that becomes such a, I, in my own life, when I am, when my, when my vision is, is that close, my life feels far more confusing and chaotic. And in his understanding of things is the importance of myth is that you go from living one foot in front of front of yourself to you're standing now on a on a mountaintop you're broadening your perspective of things where before you were you could only you're so limited in what you could see that myth opens up and shows you that small space that you were in but how it how it's fitting in with the rest of things right and that and how that can take us out of a place of confusion and you know we talk a lot about calling and purpose and help us to understand a lot of those things and and i especially think you know in our day and age where things are so quick and it's you know it's like we're where the biggest news story of the day can be about some shit that you know earlier that morning you know what i mean and it's just like how fucking close perspective you know and then it's just on to the next thing on to the next thing on to the next thing where are we finding our perspective you know like sometimes it's surprising to me you know it's <laughs> maybe i'm gonna need to do like a a big social media break <laughs> one of these days not even that i spend a lot of time on it at all but you know like all of these sort of videos that people make reacting to just you know what this person said what this person did what this like who fucking cares you know like to, to such a large extent it's like what is this like what does this have what does that have to do with anything right like what like what are we where are we going as a culture? What are we trying to, rather than just this sort of reactionary to just like seemingly random events, like where do we find, where do we find a clear sense of direction there? But it's just, I don't know. There's a kind of, there's a kind of frantic madness that, that strikes me with, with that kind of engagement with life that seems to be pretty common for so many of us. And why I think that for me, I know there's why that's why there's this, there's this calling, there's this deep calling to a return to this, these ancestral elements of, of myth, because I'm not getting any, stronger sense of the world and my relationship to the world through people you know giving their two cents on somebody's fucking tiktok you know like that like that there's no it's it's again it's too close in front of us it's too short-sighted it doesn't broaden the perspective of of anything so I don't know. I don't have a good closing thought to finish that one up, but truth, man, truth. Well, you know, I'm, I was thinking about it, you know, as you're talking, I'm like, I, I think there's a certain element of, we want to be accepted by the tribe and we want to, you know, acceptance is not something that we always talk about. I think in our culture is like, it's such an important part of the human journey is you know, and when people are looking, I mean, it's almost embarrassing when you, when you talk about it, it's almost embarrassing when I even talk about the fact that like these things exist, like you think about it, it's like, what a fucking joke. But like, there is probably a certain element of, we watch people react on like a TikTok or something like that, or, you know, various forms of this. I'm not saying that's your medium, but we care about other people's reactions because it's a cue on how we should think. And so it's like, oh, you see it that way, that helps me guide myself and how I should see it because I'm looking for cues all the time on, 
you know, what's acceptable in the tribe and what's weird and what's, you know, and, um, it is very hard to be weird and to be like somebody that doesn't quite get how things work. Like when, you, when everybody has a reaction a certain way and you don't see it that way. And then all of a sudden you're the outsider that can be very hard for us. And we may even be right. We may even be correct in our observation, which is a, a outside, but we tend to conform to the group because there's such a danger and a risk, you know, like, like in us, not being accepted and not being a part of the group. And, you know, I think this is where, you know, good and bad, they play a part, you know, or sometimes we, you know, the bad, the, the group is doing something bad, but we'd rather be accepted by the group than, than contemplate is this good or right. Um, myth has a, has an ability, I think in some ways to explore some of these things for us to help us confront some of these things. Um, it's a, it's, you know, I think like the hero's journey is a, such an important part of myth. Um, and, you know, the hero can be anybody. And I think that we often think of the hero as like, you know, I'm, for example, the lead singer of the band. You know, we think of, uh, you know, the, the, the movie star, the, you know, the CEO, right? We think of the person who's in the leadership position as the hero, but that's not necessarily the hero. And one thing I love about story is I love taking a character that's in a position that shouldn't be a hero and, and turning them into a hero. The, the person that's almost the un, un, unexpected hero, you know? Um, I mean, you could make a story. I mean, just for example, you know, if somebody dared to go do this and they had the interest in it, is a story about the hero being the drummer of the band or the bass player of the band, you know? Whereas we culturally think of that person as more of the ensemble. We're like, well, I want to know about the lead singer. And when you think about the people who are making music, you often think about the person singing the lyrics or the lead guitarist maybe, but you don't necessarily think about all the other people that are contributing. And in some times in life, you may have the, let's say luxury or opportunity or sometimes it's like more of a negative thing, but you might be the lead singer or the CEO or the leader. And it's sometimes it seems good. And sometimes it's not good at all to be that position, but it doesn't mean that from your position, you can't be a hero in your journey. And I think what myth does is it sometimes can give us an opportunity to see ourselves as we can be more than we think we are from the position we're in. Whereas we may be pursuing this thing in life, we're going like, once I get here, once I become this person, then I can be a hero in my life. Then I can be this, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be whatever. And it's like, well, no, you are where you are right now. And you're, you know, you can tell a story and you can make it captivating if you follow the principles of story and the principles of myth from any character in any position. And stories are endless that way. But if you do the right things, if you, if you bring myth into the story, no matter where the position of the character is or person or whatever, we are willing to go along with you if you honor our time-held traditions of myth, which is that, you know, if they're reluctant, there's implications if they're unreluctant or whatever, if that's a word, <laughs> their, their implications, you know, give them a shadow, give them a flaw, you know, I don't care who they are. I don't care if they're a janitor. I, I'm i willing to go on your mythical journey if you honor these time true traditions because I'm after a truth that only myth can tell through this character. And I think that's kind of like, this is this conversation has been like that for me. It's been like, oh man, fucking I look out into it. It's just like the vast opportunity of where we could explore this idea. And I go, man, we're only going to get like a bite of it done, you know? And I, and I, I've kind of made my peace with that as we've gone through this conversation. Um, but dude, it's, it's been fun. I mean, I feel like, I feel like we could go on and on and on. So I'm going to, I'm going to throw it in and say, let's talk about beer. Let's wrap up our ideas. And you know what? I feel like this is an idea. This is a thread that will probably continue on through future podcast episodes in various forms and various ways. But, um, yeah, man, it's been it's been a fun journey to even just take a bite out of this idea of myth with you today. So, I mean, I feel like it's probably something that's going to be cropping up from. I mean, 
I don't know for sure, but like, I feel like this is one of those things. It's like, uh, no, this is just kind of a now part of, of my, of my universe now, yeah. like a part of how I'm looking at everything now is through the eyes of, of myth, or at least trying to see it more that way. And I think that in so many ways, this podcast and our conversations have, have already incorporated so many of those elements. This just feels kind of like a natural, more direct way to, to sort of have this conversation. And it seems only, yeah, it only seems natural. So talking about beer here for a second. Uh, so I brought this one in today and this is from Lighthouse Brewing Company. And this is called the Race Rocks Amber Ale. And it's good. You know, like it's, I was, I sort of bought it. I was sort of attracted to the look of it. Uh, if I'll, I'll be completely honest, it just kind of had this, I don't know, this very sailory kind of, you know, simple aesthetic to, to the can and the label. And then, so I just got it. And then I was like, it's like, Oh, it says like, has like notes of caramel and chocolate. And very often that's kind of like a, that, that doesn't always cooperate with me. Uh, I sometimes find it's like a little bit, a little bit too thick. <laughs> sometimes but this has been really tasty i've been i've been pleasantly uh pleasantly drinking this one the way through this conversation i totally agree with you man um you know i read that there just now and i was like yeah you know when i had i didn't i i knew nothing about the beer i just you know poured it into my <laughs> glass and i had a sip and i was like this tastes really good it's i mean it's just really it's really good beer it's really tasty scottish ale um yeah chocolate and too much or too much caramel you know especially in combination it's like you're like i don't know about that but they did a they did a good job because to me with those two elements they just need to be subtle and if they're subtle which this is to me that's like oh it's a delicious beer and um i didn't really know what i was tasting because i never read anything about the beer before we we had it but i was just like yes yeah, it's really good it's really good it's been really enjoyable um all right, I, I suppose I'll wrap up since I have the mic All in my right. hand. Um, oh man, well, you know I've been uh, I've been exploring myth and storytelling in particular, and I do think myth probably extends beyond just story. I think it it there there is a certain element that probably um, th that's probably captured in other mediums of art, and and I have yet to even filter that through my mind at this point. I'm still trying to, you know, I'm still, I think what's happened for me in this last week in particular is my appreciation for myth has increased substantially and my willingness to pay attention to it and look into it has opened up in a way that was never quite as I wasn't able to do before. And once I started to kind of see how these truths almost permeate through our culture and through great mediums of art, and I started looking at other movies and stories and novels and things that I had encountered, I was like, whoa, myth is there and it's there. And I just, it's like all of a sudden it started jumping off the page and I was like, it's there and it's so seamless. That's what makes it so fucking cool. It's like, I didn't notice it and I didn't need to notice it. But now that I do, I'm like, I kind of just appreciate it. And, you know, and I, I, I could talk for ages about some of these things, but the two things that I really um, appreciated this week was something we talked about, which was the reluctant hero and the shadow. And those were two things that have, I, I, I've, I've been working on about three stories right now that I've been slowly developing and formulating and they're coming along fantastic. But this week I was like, Hey, let me, let me integrate some of this kind of reluctant hero and shadow element. And man, it binded the stories in a way that was like missing links started just coming together. I was like, Holy shit myth. Like now that I'm aware of this, I'm like, this is a fucking well, I can just keep going back to this well to like enrich what I'm working on. I'm like, how fucking cool. And then that obviously opened my mind into my own life and how myth plays a part in my own journey and very cool shit. Just, that's all I got to say. So, uh, you know, 
to wrap this baby up, I feel like uh, this is the beginning of something that Evan and I will probably be able to talk about more directly. And I think that's really exciting. I do think we've been talking about myth since the beginning of this whole podcast. We just maybe didn't know it. Um, but it is kind of neat to have some of the things that were happening kind of come up and go, oh yeah, that's always kind of been there. And now that I know that, I can embrace it a little bit more because I understand how it plays a part in this whole thing. And I just think it's really cool. That's, I don't have any advice. That's all I got to say. You know, coming back to the title of this one, which was, which was your title. <laughs> you just kind of spat it out there. I was like, I love that. The reality of myth, you know, like I, I just love that whole, you know, that whole little statement because there seems something something about it that that is that seems contradictory right like that doesn't make sense about it because like the reality of myth like isn't myth isn't myth something that's not true you know which is interesting because you look up the definition of myth and a lot of places have their first definition of basically saying like it's something that's made up to try and explain natural phenomenon and blah 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 right like it's like it's almost like it's this is an antiquated thing that we've we've long since disposed of and and no longer need and it's just like holy shit man do we need myth you know because because of the reality that it is speaking to you know that that's part of i think the problem is that a lot of people who take things very literally if you read a myth, literally, you're going to, you're going to be walking out pretty empty handed at the end of the day. You're going to be pretty nonplussed by your experience of it. But when you dig into them and, and you start uncovering that it's like, oh no, this is speaking to a kind of reality of our experience mm -hmm. and, yes. and, and how, how vital that is. You know, you, you're, before you were talking about, you know, how we go along with, with the crowd, you know, it's like, oh, you know, we listen to a lot of people with their comments on, you know, this shit and that shit and whatever. And, and be, because yes, there is that part of wanting to be accepted, even though we might have our own, a different view on something, we can be convinced by somebody not just because not because they've necessarily made a better point but because we just find ourselves on the outside and when you said that i thought yeah but he's like he's like if that was the final word on that we would be in so much trouble if that was just the final word uh in that story is that like yep that's just what it is we just go along with whatever everyone says all the time i i can't imagine how horrid a society and a world we'd be living in if that were the case. I mean, if you think that the world is, you know, I'm not saying that this is my view, but if you're a person who thinks that the world is just like a shithole now, can't even imagine what it would be like if that were the case. The reason why that's not the case is because of myth. It's because we have stories of people who, who did the thing that was different from everyone else who saw something, who had to go somewhere and do something that was not popular, that was not what people from their, their tribe did, you know? And it was so important and essential that they did. It was because of those stories that throughout time, we found the strength to do those in those kinds of moments. We've been able to look to those stories to draw strength, right? To, to do those things, to become who we are, even if that's doing something that seems totally that, that it, to the reasonable logical mind is a totally crazy thing to do, but it was so important that you did the crazy thing that, that, that hero did the crazy thing. Can I say something? Yeah. 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 Okay. I don't want to, I want to carry on with this because I love what you're saying. There's another part of myth, which we never talked about, <laughs> but it's one of those things maybe we'll visit another day, but you, there's a part of the myth you know, it's Campbell's idea, but it's, it's it return with the elixir, which is a pertinent part of the myth, which is you come back 
to the tribe with the elixir, you come back with the thing, the knowledge, the wisdom, the experience, and you share that. And if you look at, um, one of the things is I think we love adventure. I think there's a certain element of us, which we all respect the adventurer, even if we don't agree with them or understand them in the beginning, when they come back with the elixir, we understand their journey and they, and, and there's a certain amount of respect the, the adventurer gets, which is that I didn't support you on your way off from the tribe. And I didn't want you to go because I would miss you. And I didn't want you to leave and I wanted you to be here and all of this, but you came back with an insight and a knowledge and you shared that with us and, you know, bless you for going off and finding this and bringing this back to us, which has all made us better. And had you not been strong enough to go against what was safe and convenient and comfortable and agreed upon, we would have never had the chance to overcome this you know, this thing. And so there is a part of the, the, uh, hero's journey and the myth of the hero's journey, which is that, yes, you go off on this hard and challenging adventure that's going to push you through the dark night of the soul and face your shadow. But there's, there's like, you know, there's a promise of return. And I think that's part of the reason why you go and then you return, they call it return with the elixir kind of idea. And it's like, yes, you come back with something, some wisdom, some idea. And when you come back home, not only are you transformed, but what you're transformed with helps transform everyone else. And those make our teachers and mentors and things like that. Right. And it's why we look up to them because they were once the adventurer and the story didn't end with them just conforming. And again, why it's so important for us to come back to these stories, whether they're they're old ones or they're modern retellings of of these stories. But again, not putting superficial, you know, transplanting superficial agendas on top of them, but actually communicating the deep, 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 deep things that that they're communicating and remembering those things because. They are, they're, they are so essential and they also, you know, they also bring a creative element to our lives as well because they are very, and, and not creative necessarily in the sense of, you know, being a creative person and, you know, making art, but being a creative human being, which is being a participant in life and, and with, with others, being a member of your community you know, building in whatever way you build, you know, like that's, that's a creative life, right? Bringing light, bringing, bringing, um, bringing light, healing, whatever it is into your community is a creative life. And myth is teaching us about how we do that, right? In, in so many regards, it's, it's, teaching us and telling us ways in which in which we can do that which is just another reason why it's so essential why we remember these i think i had some other point but <laughs> to to that effect i had something and then it's but it's um oh you know i was thinking of as you were talking i i was reminded of a terrific book called uh, care of the soul by thomas moore and he's a big, he's a big lover of myth himself. And, you know, one of the things about, you know, going to the classic ones especially is in, because I think classic myths, you know, because they connect us to our ancient human lineage, you know, there's something very powerful about that. And... if we can learn to look at our own lives in a mythic sense, which I think is part of the problem. It's not just like, Oh, that was a good story. You know, it's, it's because it's because of how intimate these stories are with who we are that those myths help us to look more creatively and mythically at our own lives. And there's something so much 
more enjoyable about that too. You know, like we, because of how rational and literal we often look at, at things in our, in our life, you know, it's like, I'm just thinking even for myself, you know, I've recently been feeling a little bit like, oh man, you know, like this sort of, what am I, you know, it's like, what am I doing with my life right now? Like, it's like, I'm feeling, you know, just like, I'm not doing anything or going anywhere. I'm feeling stagnant, blah, 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 blah. And just the, what if I thought about my life more mythically in the sense of like, well, why? And he's like, yeah, I'm a little lost at sea right now. You know, like there's, there's this poeticism that myth can help us see our own lives in rather than just putting the sort of cold literal language to our things it's like well what if you're just a little lost at sea you know and just reminded that like hey your life is poetry you know don't think that these are just things in the stories those stories are are about you these stories are about you and we could be well served to look at our lives in the same mythic ways Thank you for listening in on our conversation today. We hope you found something helpful that you can carry forward with you. Head over to our website, wayoftheartist.com, for more free exclusive material and learn about the show. If you haven't already, please support us by subscribing to the show, sharing it with people you know, and keeping compassionate, creative conversation going.